I guess the points I am making, and I'm going to underline now, are, are that gas, as in the general adaptation syndrome, is not a thing. It is not a thing. It was completely sensible based on the evidence that Celia had. But to talk that there's a general adaptation to all stimuli, the, the bottom fell out of that 50 years ago. It is, you know, what's the right word? It's been removed, ex exhumed, expunged from stress phys physiology. It is not a thing. We thought it was a thing. It made sense as a thing. We got more evidence. Now it is not a thing. There is no general adaptation. And that's not, you know, me saying this as some, like, half-assed coach. This is the science. This is the, you know, talk to us, the um, stress physiology. It's, it's not a thing. It's got to go. And it's still been published in, you know, from a sports science perspective, training science perspective, it's... It's still been published in you know, high-ranking journals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, it is not a thing. Welcome to the Mops and Mo's podcast with Alex and Drew. Drew, I know this is one you've been excited about for a minute. Who are we talking to? I'll keep. So I'm, I'm gonna. I won't turn into a total fanboy, but. We're talking to John Kiley, which if you know the name, you've probably read some of his work. Um, he has an incredibly lengthy bio. He's been coaching for over 30 years on a number of different levels. I'll run through a few of them. So 2018 FIFA Soccer World Cup, 2015 Rugby World Cup, 2008 Olympics, 2004 Paralympics, Junior and Senior World Athletic Championships, um, he's worked one-on-one -on -one with a couple of athletes in a number of different sports, squash world champions, triple jump world champions, European gold medalists, world championship gold medalists, Olympic medalists from a number of different countries. Alongside all of that, though, he's done a ton of grassroots coaching, mostly in combat sports, but also football, him being Irish football means soccer, and then also track and field. We referenced this in the uh, conversation with him as well. But low key, he's a two time Irish heavyweight boxing champion. So if you disagree with some of the things he's saying, you're more than welcome to step into the ring with him. Um, but the way that I was introduced to John originally, and the way that I think a lot of folks know of John's work is through his writing. So he's published over 50 articles. We have him on today to talk specifically about some of the misconceptions around periodization. Um, we mentioned a couple of those articles. The ones that I would direct folks to specifically, if you just Google John Kiley and type in periodization, most of these will come up, but periodization paradigms in the 21st century, and then also periodization theory, uh, confronting an inconvenient truth. Those are sort of his two calling cards, I think, and what have made him the most, we'll say controversial in the human performance space. And essentially what, what he did was start to ask a lot of questions around the periodization, capital P periodization paradigm, and whether it makes the most sense in the kind of contemporary human performance space, given the way that the field of stress psychology has changed, the way that physiology has changed. And he points out some interesting things, which we get into in the conversation, some of which I think, especially when we talk about strength coaches, we may not necessarily recognize that a lot of what feeds into the way that we think about stuff comes from different fields. So we talk about Hans Selye, we talk about adaptation, we talk about homeostasis versus allostasis. So if you like some of the things that he gets into, or you're interested to learn more, obviously, again, I would direct you towards the writing, but he also works at the University of Limerick in Ireland, with a professional doctorate and PhD program. And so if, if, again, this is kind of something from an academic standpoint that you're interested in, please reach out. He is incredibly willing to chat with anybody about anything. He's been a mentor of mine for years now and has no business answering all the different questions that I text him on a pretty frequent basis. I've gone on long enough now, but Alex, I'll turn it over to you to kind of put a bow on it. 
this topic has definitely been a contentious one a few times. Um, it, it gets some people a little bit heated because we are absolutely going to challenge things you might have found in the first 20 or 30 pages of your textbook or like the second or third slide of or the your class whole you textbook. like to teach. Your whole textbook. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some pretty foundational stuff that really it, it comes down to kind of old science that was used as the basis for new stuff. And then when that old science changed, nobody ever went back and really looked at it. Um, so there's, there's some good conversation here around that. And I think we do a pretty good job of keeping it practical and useful and not going too far down the rabbit hole of nerdy stuff. But there will be some strong statements here that might make you mad, especially if you're a coach with strong opinions about periodization. Well, and it's so on that note too, like we, so John knows that a lot of this stuff, I mean, he's, he's made these, he's wrote these papers several years ago now, but he's already agreed to come back on and chat. So if some of the things we get into, you have an interest in engaging in them or, or hearing more about them, or you want to sort of, I don't want to say fight them because that sounds bad, but if you want to engage, like, please reach out to the Instagram, reach out to us, offer up questions and we can bring John back on to kind of go through it. Because like I mentioned, he's incredibly open and willing to share. And one of his favorite things to do is to sort of educate coaches who have either been in the game for a long time or are just getting into the game, how to really look at training athletes. So this, this is a fun one. And from a like strength and conditioning standpoint, as a coach myself, if I've only ever done one thing for the tactical space, and that would be introduce John Kiley, I think that that would be, I'd be pretty pleased with that. All right, let's do it. I've always just messed up the intro to that, so... No, that was perfect. The, the more messed up, the better. We don't have any kind of plan for this stuff. <laughs> okay, great. All right, perfect. So uh, my entry point was, uh, I guess if you go back to the very origins of it, I came from a kind of combat martial arts type background. You know, um, going through what was a conventional kind of grading system, you know, going up through the belts, through my, through you know a couple of black belts, <laughs> but it always felt really disconnected from reality. You know, I um, without giving too much away, I may have dabbled in some extracurricular combat activities outside of the gym, and <laughs> the disconnect is pretty stark um, between what some kind of guru type martial arts figure is telling you in the in the dojo or in the gym and and what's happening in the in the real world and um yeah so yeah it started me thinking and, and i was coaching young I, I, was, I was coaching kind of martial arts at 22 like at that stage i'd moved away from the tradition and i was just combat just kickboxing uh, I, was, I was a national champion kickboxer for a couple of years. I was a, an international toy boxer for a bit. And then I changed over to boxing later in, in you know, kind of mid-20s. And I was national champion there a couple of times. And I had maybe 17, 18 internationals. So kind of been around the block in, in those sports. But back to the start. So everything was very conventional. And the expectation is... Uh, there is somebody here with greater experience and they're going to tell you what, what to do and that is the right way to do it because it's been done forever. Uh, and really, really quickly, I can see flaws there. And once you get into the ring, you know, whether it's kickboxing or conventional boxing or whatever, you kind of see, well, actually, this kind of pre-programming in this scenario, do this, in this scenario, do this, this is the solution to this problem. It obviously doesn't hold any water in reality. It is uh, trying to make people robust and equip them with problem solving capabilities and uh, sufficient psychological, emotional, physiological resilience to cope with the challenges they've been faced with. So I didn't want to question everything. I had no motivation to question everything. I just at the time was really motivated to be as good I could be, as good as I could be in those sports. I, I you know, I trained really hard and yeah, I, I, I lived it for quite a long time. 
So whether or not that prior experience was relevant or you know influential on me or not, but when a few years later I was this was starting to become my career. I'd already been coaching for four or five years. Uh, um, a sports science undergraduate degree started in the university nearby. So, you know, I was, sports was my thing. So I, I went and I did that. So I was moving towards a career in, in that and I was reading more of the, the literature. And that, that experience in combat sports in terms of, you know, the plan goes out the window first contact with the enemy, right? Plan goes out the window. Uh, and obviously we could pick that apart. And But in a very broad sense, it's right. It's very hard to have a detailed plan for all the events that life throws at you and all the different influencing factors, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess I carry that over to my approach to training theory. And what I came up against relatively quickly was a perception that well if you want to plan and periodization obviously is our predominant planning module or uh, model well it's a case of first you do this then you do this then you do this and it's very logical it's very mechanical uh, and all you need is a little bit of excel skills and you're you know you can produce fantastic nicely colored plans but once you are working in the real world, do those plans hold up? You can make them hold up. You can make them hold up by come hell or high water, you're delivering what it says on the piece of paper. But is that the right way to look at something as complex as human adaptation to, to training? Okay, so I guess that was my entry point. Now, you know, uh, long before I was working in the university, I was I was a practitioner just for the longest time. As I said, coaching since I was 22. Um, and gradually, you know, like most people do, we started to move up and work with higher, higher levels of, of athletes. Uh, I'm Irish. I lived in Ireland. I moved to the UK. Uh, bigger pot. I had, a, I had a good role working in track and field, working with... Uh, uh, UK athletics in the in the run up to the Beijing Games, and was working with just phenomenal athletes. My mo main motivation for going there was, you know, to learn to learn from the best. But what I found was that how coaches were thinking about planning wasn't any different to what you know the kind of lower level coaches that I had been working was do what, what they were doing the difference really was the athletes were a lot better um, and I struggled for a long time trying to discern what makes a good coach and it's it's very hard because I worked with coaches who had, had fantastic success and were obviously you know by anyone's standards highly successful, great coaches. But they didn't look anything like this other person over here who might be in the same sport or same event, who also had huge success, you know, in Olympics and uh, world medals, but did everything nearly completely differently. And it was just really hard to see the common factor. Some of them were very strong in training theory. Some of them were, you'd have to say, not very strong in training theory, as you'd evaluate by, you know, by their peers, it was all really, really mixed bag. And the only common factor I could really discern was those great coaches, when they were at their peak of success, the athletes really, really believed in them. They believed in their coach. They really, really bought into the program. The program would be the same program that they're delivering perhaps in lean years and you know the same program they deliver in years where, where they have huge success. But what often did seem to change, and this was obviously just me as a lone observer, was the environment, 
the buy-in from the athlete, the coach-athlete relationship, all these things that we normally think of as kind of soft skills, little add-ons, nice to have. From my practical observation, they seem to be the things that were driving the success more than anything else. So, and just to kind of fast track all of this, in the literature, for the longest time and still, what we have are academics writing papers, presenting at conferences, uh, talking about periodization as a scientifically rooted paradigm for understanding how best to coach or train athletes or help athletes develop. And there's lots we can talk about about the underpinning science. But what I would say is that's what we have in the academic literature, in the journals. This is the way to do it. Now, recently, myself and a doctoral student at the German Sports University University in Cologne called uh, Ketchy Anika Danes, Anika Danes, we did a survey um, and we got over 100 coaches, you know, professional coaches, different sports. And we asked them a load of questions, but two of the questions are pertinent to what we're talking about here. And one was, uh, and I forget the exact way it was phrased, but what is the most important uh, factor driving training, physical training adaptation? And more coaches said uh, non-physical factors than physical factors. So non-physical factors was 38%, where non-physical factors is things like psychoemotional stress, belief, buy-in, confidence in the plan, these type of things. 33% were neutral, you know, they were on the fence. And I believe it was 24% or 28%, whatever's left over anyway, was, well, no, the physical factors are the most important influence. Now, obviously, this is just a survey. But what it is doing is highlight the disconnect between, here's the theory. Here's what people are saying. Here's what people are writing. Here's the way we're all conditioned to think. And we are all conditioned in this very, you know, this has nearly been beaten into us on our grandmother's knee. This is how you plan. But there seems to be a lot of confusion in the field and a lot of ideas and thoughts in the field that don't connect with the theory. But my experience talking to coaches is, coaches nearly feel guilty talking against the theory because the theory and I'm talking about periodization here, it's so pervasive, it's been around for so long, it's so embedded, it's so kind of fossilized in our minds that it nearly seems to be heresy to, to be questioning it. And yeah, that's where my thoughts are going just on that particular question. So I better, I'll pause there just so you can kind of reorient me. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that the non-physical factors, like you could argue that they're the most important piece. Cause one thing that we talk about a lot, especially in this community, and honestly, a lot of it is like behind closed doors. But when you start to look at what you think might be the most successful programs at some of the more high level units, the question is always how compliant are the athletes with, you know, the embedded staff, because most of the debates and discussions, when you get a lot of coaches together revolve around, what should tactical training look like? What reps and sets should we use? What movements should we use? What should the assessment look like? What's the data? It's all very physical, but behind that is this sort of elephant in the room of like only 10% of the guys at your unit are even utilizing your services. So if maybe the discussion shifted more towards how do you create a positive training environment? How do you create buy-in? How do you create belief in this program? Because we're going up against I mean, at least on the American side, a couple hundred years of the way things are, quote unquote, but nobody is really having discussions around how do you master some of these soft skills? It's always, should we back squat or should we front squat? And I think that that's kind of missing the point, which you sort of touched on. There's a couple of things there. 
soft skills really isn't a good term and I know I, I use it, it first in this conversation but it, it's, it's not a good term um, and I think that a lot of our problems now are rooted in what is generally called biomedical beliefs where biomedical belief would be you know if 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 I get a scan and my knee is a bit grotty or you know there's a few defects in that scan then that then that equals pain and that pain will be in some way linearly dependent on the amount of damage in my tissues and that's clearly not the case but that's a kind of example of a biomedical belief it's like separation of brain and body separation of emotions, cognitions from your physical capacity. Now, when you say it openly, everyone will say, no, no, I don't believe in that. You know, obviously I don't believe in that biomedical model. And this would go for doctors as well, but yet how many, be it uh, a medic or a coach or whoever it is, a, a rehabber, how often do we think of that? Because the thing we seem to put all the emphasis on is, Here's the exercises, here's the design, here's the parameters, here's the frequency, here's the intensity ranges, et cetera, et cetera. We do very little in terms of, okay, so I'm working with you, you've hurt your knee or you know, the, you've, you've some kind of knee, you've just had an ACL repair. What do you believe about this, for example? So screening the athlete's beliefs. Because if you're working with an athlete, and if we did the little thought exper experiment, say you kind of cleave me and take my DNA and replicate me with you know, the exact same life history, the exact same experiences, exact same thoughts. So there's two identical me's right now. And you program an intervention for me. And one version of me thinks, that's a heap of crap. And the other version of me thinks, yeah, okay, I trust this coach, I'm going to go for it. That's not a nice to do. That's not like, okay, well, he mightn't buy in as much. That's going to be a complete change in the, uh, let me put it this way. Your brain looks out at the world. It, its only interaction with the world is through the senses. All of those senses have to be interpreted. All those senses, senses have to be sifted for meaning. All that meaning can be broken down into, is this a good thing or a bad thing for me? Is this a threat or is this safe? Is this positive or negative? And, you know, and that's the way if you think about it, our brain works, evolutionary conditions since time began. But if I'm looking out through my eyes and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not so sure about this, or I really don't like that exercise, or the doc told me that I'd always have trouble with my back, or, 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 or. Well, that's not just background information, that actually changes, first of all, your neurochemistry, that drives downstream changes, that changes your kind of hormonal profile, that changes how resources, valuable resources within your body are being allocated. A really good example is, an extreme example is, if you get a kid, um, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, but in those kind of peak growth years, and you highly stress them, so, for example, they live in a village in a war-torn air, torn area versus they live in a village 50 kilometers away. These kids, on average, will be short. Why? Much more stress. What is stress? Stress is really a red flag going, whoops, danger. What happens if you're in danger? Okay, well, I'm going to conserve my resources. I'm not going to you know, waste resources on a building project for a future that might not exist. And this doesn't just go for things like bone growth, which are well documented, but for neural growth, for, for brain growth as well. Now, luckily, kids kind of can catch up really quick. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a long-term thing, but that's just an extreme example of something that happens with athletes all the time. So with an athlete, if they, uh, psychoemotional stress is one of the major risk factors for injury. Why? Well, it's going to change how you move or how you control the movement. It's going to change things like um, not just the biochemistry that underpins and serves as a foundation for all um, adaptations, but uh, muscle tensions. Things are going to be a little tight. 
things are going to be uh, not as fluid as fluent uh, as normal. So, yeah, I find that a useful way to look at it. It's like, if this person, if we're going to impose a training stress on someone and we want a positive outcome, which obviously we do, it's not enough just to hypothesize. And that's all it is. It's just waving our hands in the air. This is the best program. This is the best exercise. We have to lay that training stimulus on a foundation. And that foundation is in part shaped by how the athlete interprets that training stress. But so, we, do, we do no work here. We do lots of work here. I'm sure that Drew is about to take this in a, in a Hans Selye direction and I'm excited for that conversation. I just, this, this seems like a good chance to like inject a little bit of the, the tactical professional perspective, at least from, from my background, just being a soldier before I got into the, into this whole space. And I think you bring up a really powerful point because we, if you run around the conventional military and talk to people about how they feel about physical training many of them dread it and wish they could not participate in it and wish they could go do their own thing. And they think it breaks them down. And, and even some of the data supports that it's the, the most injurious thing we do. And we hurt more people during physical training than we do in combat and things like that. And so I think there's, there's a really important conversation here about when the, the quote unquote athletes you're training show up, you can't assume some of the things you got to assume with competitive, like collegiate or professional athletes, because those guys, that's probably the, the part of their life where they get to show off how good they are at certain things and they can feel comfortable in that environment. And we're working with a population that might be terrified of that environment and really uncomfortable there. And that's, that's a conversation we don't have very often. We switch right over to sets and reps and all that kind of thing. But like you said, it's a foundation that has to be built and we can make even fewer assumptions about that foundation probably in coaches in an athletic setting can? Well, first of all, I think that's a great point. And obviously, well, okay, so small side note. Athletes, because they invest so much in their training, they get, you know, they get, they are very prone to stress, persistent stress, anxiety. Uh, and you see all kinds of things, you know, when relationships, for example, go bad, injuries would spike in a particular group, all those type of things. But, I mean, I agree with your point. The, the populations that you work with, what their experience is, is, is very, very real stress. Um, no, and I think that there's a maybe a traditional kind of perspective on this that it's all touchy-feely and it's all kind of, you know, not appropriate or, you know, it's kind of just do it mindset. And yes, you do have to build physical robustness and mental resilience in your population for sure. But I think that, I know I haven't done any work with US military, but certainly with UK Armed Forces, I've, I've had a couple of doctoral students through um, and, you know, some small bits of work. And the injury rates are really, really high. And uh, what I would think of, and just personal opinion, unnecessarily high. Um, unnecessarily, because I think the simple things, and obviously, we, you know, we're talking about scale here. You can't have a half an hour conversation with someone if you're dealing with 150 or 200 or however many soldiers, but how can you, how can you take these um, insights and scale them? Well, one thing you can do uh, really easily is provide little, really quick, but progressive snippets of education. Give you an example. If you, I don't know, let's call it 40, 50 recruits and you give them, this is actually, be, uh, sorry, I know I'm flipping around here. Let me give you an example of what's been done in the uh, kind of what's conventionally called the mindset um, research. So all mindset is, it, it, from an academic perspective, is your set of beliefs, associations, biases that are associated with a specific phenomenon. Not everything, it's not like you have one type of mindset for all of your life. It's like, I might have one type of mindset around, 
I don't know, getting up early in the morning. I might have another mindset about what I do when I'm sick. You know, it, it, it's that type of thing. So anyway, uh, and the numbers were pretty high, maybe 364 business executives. They both got 15 minutes, a 15 minutes talk on stress. Both of the, the presentations they got were factual. In other words, they were rooted in actual evidence. Only difference uh, in one talk, the effects of stress were framed negatively. So stress is associated with 80% of GP visits. Uh, stress increases anxiety, which increases heart rate. Yada, yada, yada. The other group, 15 minutes, um, and again, a big group. And it was just, okay, stress is enhancing. Stress, it increases your heart rate, but that enables you to get more blood, more oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. It sharpens cognition. It was the mirror image, but just positively framed. Then these people go out and they do a, a, in a lot of these studies, they use a public presentation as a stress test. And then they check their hormones after them and their performance. And, you know, you obviously know where I'm going. There's stress is enhancing versus stress is destructive mindset. Their mindsets were changed with that short intervention and they performed better and had more productive, positive hormonal profiles. Subsequent. Now, sorry if I've labored that point, but it's just to say there are things that we can get in here that we can infiltrate into conventional training programs, conventional training plans that aren't wishy-washy, touchy-feely, let's all like check our breathing for 15 minutes a day or anything like that. It is just, here's the facts, folks. Yeah. Um, and you, you, have, you have done something there that you would struggle to do in a six-week training program. Again, uh, what you're doing is you're, you're changing, you're, you're kind of plowing the ground and making the ground more fertile for, for the, for the uh, training stimuli that you're going to overlay on it. So that's... There's a couple of things there. I think, again, I'm going to pull from the medical literature now, but what they've started to investigate is, is there a benefit of screening patients' beliefs before we prescribe medication? And yes, it is. Once you know the patient's beliefs, then you can say, well, actually, this is the current evidence, or this is how we currently look at that. You can change it. So there's something around screening there's something about nudging beliefs. And again, this can be done in little micro bursts. Okay, guys, our folks, you have to listen up, three minutes, whiteboard, boom, boom, boom. Okay, off you go. So things like that. Now, is this useful? Will I keep going on, on this track or do you want to interject with a, with a question point in the right direction? I'm loving it. No, I think, okay. I think it's incredibly useful. Okay, so... You know, I mean, obviously you've heard of placebo and nocebo phenomenon. Now, conventionally they're associated with um, deceit. You know, you fool someone, you tell someone a lie. But there is a phenomenon called honest placebo. And an honest placebo is where, so one of the famous studies in this, you get a load of uh, irritable bowel syndrome sufferers who have chronic pain. And seemingly this is extremely painful. So these people are people that have been around all the shops, they've gone to the various medics and they can't get a cure. So they're recruited for this trial. Again, I forget the exact numbers, three, 400. Um, and half of them come in and the doctor is there and he says, these are sugar pills. There is no medical therapeutic value in these. But placebos have shown to alleviate pain in the following conditions and the following circumstances, off you go and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And those placebo pain medications um, were at least on parity, I think may have outperformed in this particular study, conventional opioid prescription. And that's definitely, if I'm getting that study slightly incorrect, it's definitely the case that placebos have outperformed standard uh, pain-killing medication. Why is that? Well, okay, it's actually, placebo is only the, um, 
placebo is the name that we put in it. But again, it's that embedded human instinct to, I'm going to go through the world. As I go through the world, I'm going to take in all these signals. I'm going to sift through these signals and determine what's important for me now. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that optimizing my chances? Is that diminishing my chances? And based on that, I adjust my biochemistry to fit the circumstances. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it, from an evolution perspective? Um, and that's what we do. But just to tie it back briefly to training theory, in training theory, and I know Drew, you might be going to come on to uh, sell you, but in training theory, we're still justifying everything we do because Selye stressed out some rats in the 20s and 30s. Then he killed them. Then he cut out their adrenal glands. Then he crushed them and then he weighed them. And then he said, oh, well, these were stressed and these weren't. Like that's the measurement stick that's still kind of guiding our lives. And he was a great scientist, but he was, he, he was, uh, he was making breakthroughs and insights without the benefit of the kind of 80, 90, 100 years of uh, experience and learning that we have. So it's, I'm often accused of disrespecting the past, whatever that means. And I'm not. How dare you? Well, I don't know how to, you know, I mean, um, I don't disrespect Sally, he was a great scientist, but. I don't think respecting someone is believing what they've said is true forevermore. That kind of sounds a little bit like hardcore religion to me. Well, it's okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll kick off the Celia question because whether people realize it or not, that idea of, you know, stimulus, alarm, response, like overtraining, all of that conversation around training is intrinsically linked to that science, which as you mentioned, and you talk about this in your papers, like it's physiological, it's biological. It completely ignores, maybe ignores is the wrong word. It just doesn't acknowledge all of the other stepping off points in terms of athlete perception. And I think we've seen this in, in some of the debates that have gone on with LinkedIn and Instagram and people saying, okay, okay, yeah, but it's all just semantics. And I think it's important to point out, like, that's a huge deal. So can you, can you touch on some of the ways in which perhaps stress theory has evolved homeostasis versus allostasis, how we've moved on from general adaptation syndrome and why clinging to that through the conversation of periodization could be doing somewhat of a disservice to the broader picture of what it really means to train athletes. I feel like there are like a million questions in that, but does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. You know, there's a million questions there, but let me take a slow through it as best I can. Um, yeah. Okay. So you've mentioned homeostasis, homeostasis and allostasis there. And so back in uh, Selye's day, the, word, the term homeostasis was there. Now, what this all gets down to fiddly little academic definitions and redefinitions 10 years later by somebody else. And oh, but in this book, he said this, and in this paper, he, the, she said that. Um, so let me just kind of shortcut it. So, homeostasis is the very reasonable deduction that. We kind of have these inbuilt reflex reflexes that help us survive in the world. So if I don't know, if if I am walking on the ice and I fall into a frozen lake, my, I will get a homeostatic response. There will be an nearly instantaneous set of responses that reflexively equip me to survive the next couple of minutes. That's you know a, a rough example of a homeostatic response. And without question, we have homeostatic response, homeostatic responses, but we don't have as many as we thought, and they're certainly not all homeostatic. 
and all of the ones that we deal with when we're conditioning people to be more resilient, more robust, they're not homeostatic responses. Homeostatic responses are suddenly the pH in your brain changes. Suddenly oxygen con content in certain parts of your brain changes. That induces an instantane instantaneous knee-jerk reflex designed to, okay, we, this is an emergency response. Does that make sense? I hope so. Allostasis is more, okay, and, and I think of allostasis as more the non-emergency type responses. And an allostatic response is, okay, you know what? Uh, I just finished a marathon. Um, I will have this array of allostatic responses. We'll all start responding. They'll all start um, changing. They won't change independently of, of each other. They'll change completely in concert with each other as orchestrated by the central nervous system. And their purpose is to, okay, we need to adapt to this massive stress this idiot is after push, putting us through. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, uh, you know, I'll make Drew feel tired so he lies down. You know, there's all those type of things. There's all types of biological things. But it's like your central nervous system trying to find what is the best change in um, how I am managing my system, how I am, I am managing uh, resources in terms of complex mo molecules, energy, et cetera, et cetera, and how am I managing behavior to optimize my recovery and subsequently adaptation. So it's not a conscious allocation, but it's an allocation that your central nervous system arrives at that is implicitly tailored to you and your history and your beliefs and your expectations. How did I do there? I was, I mean, I think it's important to point like the, the curve itself. Cause I've seen this come up where like, if we think of sort of Hans Salier's curve, it doesn't necessarily change, but this conversation adds a couple more layers to the discussion in that it's not purely biological what's happening so you do have to account for like you said the belief the expectation the the training history it's an important variable that needs to be part of the discussion as opposed to let's you know push the stimulus for three weeks taper for a week push for three weeks taper like there's other things at play that need to be accounted for well, well absolutely but just to come back and obviously i you know i I guess the points I am making and I'm going to underline now are, are that gas as in the general adaptation syndrome is not a thing. It is not a thing. It was completely sensible based on the evidence that Celia had. But the thought that there's a general adaptation to all stimuli, the, the bottom fell out of that 50 years ago. It is, you know, what's the right word? It's been removed ex exhumed, expunged from stress phys physiology. It is not a thing. We thought it was a thing. It made sense as a thing. We got more evidence. Now it is not a thing. There is no general adaptation. And that's not, you know, me saying this as some like half-assed coach. This is the science. This is the, you know, taught us the um, stress physiology. It's, it's not a thing. It's got to go. And it's still been published in, you know, from a sports science perspective, training science perspective, it's, it's still been published in uh, high ranking journals, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it is not a thing. I'm laughing because every presentation I've seen, it's literally the second slide. <laughs> yeah, I've done this on previous episodes before, and I'll, I'll do it one more time. But to the hundreds of people that I taught general adaptation syndrome to and the, the countless times I drew it on a whiteboard and all of those things. I'm sorry. It, it was it was for a reason. I got it. It takes time to like build foundations on top of foundations and things like that. But yeah, sorry. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, look, we've all done it. We're all, I mean, we, we need to start the general adaptation syndrome health group. You know, recovering, <laughs> recovering training planners or whatever. But um, what I was going to say, yeah, um, the 
point I was going to make is is gone from my head. I'm <laughs> sorry. Well, I can I can offer a question that might speed it along a little bit. I I talk a lot. It's come up on this podcast before, but there are, sometimes there are frameworks that are true but unhelpful, and sometimes there are frameworks that are maybe inaccurate or not necessarily as evidence based as we'd like them to be, but still useful in terms of they get people to make better decisions. What? How would you modify? Because I think even if there's a lot more to stress theory and maybe it's not as general as we thought it was and all of these things that model has been used to get people to make better decisions about like identifying the right amount of stimulus to get the response they're looking for all that kind of stuff how do we modify the framework to still be something that's useful but maybe slightly more evidence-based that's a great question and that's from a coaching perspective that's the important question um just to to pull back a little bit it never really made sense to me why GAS supported periodization theory. And the only conclusion I can come to is that, and again, you know, where you see it cited in all the periodization papers is it's kind of like um, talk about training planning, talk about Selye, GAS. This was a great scientist. This was a scientific breakthrough. And this explains our response to stress. Okay, that's one. Two, there's an implicit assumption there. And that curve, you know, the GAS curve you talked about. What that is doing is imposing a belief system that it is predictable. If adaptation to training stress is predictable, I can plan. The coach, and if it is not to do with the athlete's brain, it's just what the athlete does mechanically and met metabolically. I, as the coach, can sit in my throne or whatever and, and plan. I don't need to talk to the athlete or get their beliefs or see where their level of education and understanding is or what they do or don't like. I don't need to do that. I can construct it all. And that, I totally understand why people would like that. It reduces uncertainty and it gives you the, what you might think of as the, the, the veneer of scientific validation, but that's all it is. It's an illusion. It is not there. The scientific validation for you to sit down and go, well, and I'll go up 5% here and I'll go up 5% here and that will do it. That's the first point. Second point is, uh, but there's pragmatics here. You know, we can kind of wave our hands in the air about the theory all day long. But at some stage, you've got to get a plan together. And that plan can't be, well, let's do this session like this, and then we'll decide what we're going to do tomorrow. It can't be that, especially in, in context as, you know, that, that, that you folks operate in. It can't be like that. So you still have to make your, put your best foot forward. But I think what the little tweak in, in logic that we're making here, what that does is it removes a lot of the confidence slash decision-making arrogance that you would have if it's a case of, well, this is a done deal, this is the science, it's embedded, you know, Selye was a great scientist, blah, 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 blah. So these aren't, you know, I, I think it's perfectly valid for people to stick to periodization guidelines, but I don't think it's perfectly valid for scientists to say, this is the reason why, because a long, long, long time ago, blah, 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 this happened. Um, and that's what happens in the textbooks. Again, if you look at, you know, uh, I guess the biggest organization in the world is, uh, for this is probably the NCSA. They had Essentials of Strength and Conditioning, which I'm sure is on your shelf somewhere. And, they talk about periodization, they don't talk about non-physical factors or, you know, these things are fundamentally important. Sometimes it's mentioned in the literature, but it's also mentioned as a little bit of an add-on, as not the primary driver. That the primary driver is always physical training. These are kind of secondary, wiffly waffly type influences, but that is not the case. 
your brain anticipates what it is going to do. It starts to adjust to meet that uh, forecasted challenge. And, and that's what kicks off your, your adaptation response. It's not the percentage of max on the bar. I'll, uh, I'll be disappointed in myself if I don't put this one in here, but I'll quote Eisenhower real quickly. Um, his line is, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So I think we're not, we're not saying here that the whole framework of planning that you, you use is useless. No, like there's, there's valuable frameworks there to create plans that like set you up and you've considered variables that are important. It's just making sure we keep it in context with how important other factors are that you're not either not planning for or need to adjust for as you go. That's all. Exactly. But let me kind of come back with a little bit more. So, and, and I don't want to keep using the word periodization. Let's just say our, our planning convention. It has been like other fields like medicine, psychiatry, a load of other health related fields, very biomedic. The brain and body, they're totally separate. But, you know, it's your brain is driving your body. It's your brain that is allocating resources. Uh, and it allocates those resources based on, you know, am, am I, do I have a gloomy forecast or do I have a, a kind of a bright forecast? We can influence that as coaches. And we can educate the people we coach to influence that or to be aware of that or to give them skills to, to do that. Now, I guess here's the problem with our planning convention. Our planning convention, we can have that knowledge, but yet it doesn't build it into a plan. We still plan in numbers. And what I'd suggest as an easy kind of entry into this world is, okay, well, maybe I'm going to have some type of screen where a screen could be, I don't know, three questions. Uh, it could be related to prior, prior injury. It could be related to... Uh, what type of training you like or don't like. It could be anything that shows the person that you're going to train, that you're interested in their perspective, that their uh, comments are in some way important to you, that you have their best interests at heart. I think there's also feeding out that education is in terms of, you know, yeah, this is hard, but, but this is good. This is helping you. This isn't just something to be survived. This is something that's going to build you. Um, so I would much rather see programs planned in that kind of multidimensional way. So maybe I need to give them three minutes on stress management here. Maybe I need to give them a kind of a tool over here. Maybe I need to educate them a little bit on uh, preparing to come into the session. Maybe I need to give them a little window where they can, if they've come from a very stressful uh, something extremely stressful before the session. Okay, do I need to uh, modify the neurobiological background? It's going to be all stress hormones. It's not going to be productive. They're not going to get adaptations. How can I modify that? Can I allocate three minutes? Okay, guys or folks, you know, just sit, relax. Here's a couple of things to remember. Boom, boom, boom. And it's something there that's engaging it's, it's engaging them, it's refocusing them, it's perhaps calming them down, reorienting positively. Those type of micro-interventions dotted around the conventional program, I think add a, an awful lot of value. And in a way, training somebody or making someone better, enhancing performance just by focusing on the physical stuff all the time, instead of always thinking of everything I do physically is, is wrapped in this cocoon of beliefs and expectations and fears and confidences and anxieties. It's wrapped in them. Why don't I spend some bit of time modulating those things? Like picking the easy fruit, you know, little snippets of education, but that needs to go into play, I think. Um, yeah, regardless of that plan is, you know, single Olympic level athlete or a thousand recruits. Well, I think the important, one of the important pieces that 
we've touched on more than once now at this point is this idea that the appropriate way to go about planning. And, re- and really, I think this gets to the heart of the debate about like periodization versus planning and really what's the difference. Like with the appropriate plan in place, you have checkpoints that allow you to receive emerging information and then adjust accordingly. Whereas if we look at periodization, capital P in the literature, it's like you said, a very prescriptive and predictive model that assumes inputs equal outputs. And if I do 12 weeks with these percentages and these waves, I'm going to get this output. And I think that's kind of the key differentiator here, which is as a coach, at least I don't think our industry does a good job making people comfortable with the uncertainty of things and with the emergence that needs to take place. It's very much preparing you for the predictive nature of it. And then when that falls apart, and we've talked about this before on this podcast, when that falls apart, it's generally the athlete's fault. And for our world, specifically the tactical space, that's typically blamed on the ops tempo or the command environment, or we don't have enough resources. What's not being addressed is this idea that maybe to your point, as we address some of these more biopsychosocial pieces of the puzzle, we can start to have a emergent planning structure as opposed to a predictive periodized Excel sheet approach to training and i'll step off my soapbox now no well i think that i mean like that is definitely a way that the culture could go and i guess i'm not invested in, in enough to, to 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 be able to predict that but what i would say is right now you know that there are risks you can uh, modify there are gains you can accentuate just by changing how you're communicating with athletes, how you're framing things in athletes' minds. There there are big changes that you can make there. And I think that's backed up. I mean, for those who, you know, are are, are thinking about evidence, again, the placebo literature is a fantastic example there. You can just modify honestly and ethically. You can modify people's beliefs by giving them some education, maybe framing it in a way, in a, in a certain way, rather than a negative way. But if I am a recruit and I'm looking at you guys and I'm relying on you to get me through and keep me whole and uninjured, what you say really, really matters. So, but I mean, and, and this is something my friend Bert, 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 Bartholomew talks about a lot. Where's our communications? Where's our communications training as coaches? Non-existent. Or as doctors? Non-existent. But yet, communication is the water we swim in. Uh, and we need to be good at it. And we need to be careful because, again, if we're in a position of influence, people look to us and they non-consciously, they register what we say. And if we're expressing doubts or oh, I'm not really interested, yada, 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 that is a really, really bad thing. You know, so again, nobody can tell you that that's more important than how you coach your squad. Our, our objective is to be, you know, batting kind of 10 out of 10 on all of these metrics. But again, at the moment, conventionally, we're focused on one metric. What's my plan? What's my physical, what's my plan to break someone down rather than what's my plan to make uh, the whole person more resilient? And there's a difference. Um, yeah. Well, I will say, um, I wish we were not bumping up against the hour mark here because this conversation has been fantastic. And I think there's several more directions we would hope to take it in the future. And I hope we get that chance, but it's coming back. I think there's been a lot of actionable content here that, that will hopefully drive the conversation in a useful, positive direction and, and equip people with a few tools. Um, could I, could, would, would you mind if I added one thing, Alex? It's just popped into my head. Um, I mentioned the mindset li- literature. Now, it's only an emerging literature. And, you know, like everything else, there's like overlapping terms and that. But again, mindset, as I mentioned, is just your, the lens through which you contextualize a particular phenomenon. And there, there has actually in the past couple of years been a study done with, I, I believe Navy SEAL recruits. 
and where they did a very simple thing and just uh, they screened or they, they, they got a snapshot through a simple questionnaire about what their mindset was. And the people whose mindset was rated as more um, positive about kind of the, the, the recruitment process or the selection process, sorry, they were more likely to be highly rated by their peers. They were more likely, likely to survive the selection course, et cetera, et cetera. So again, all it is is this, is the way you think about something and, and that's flexible within all of us. We all have beliefs that have changed over time. Some of them we've made change by educating ourselves. And this can apply to training as well. So obviously, maybe for you as coaches, I would think there's a responsibility to, okay, well, how can I action, action these new learnings in a way that doesn't interfere with the, you know, the constraints of my environment and enhances these folks' resilience and robustness? Um, and I think it gives a lot of opportunities. And we spend so much time arguing the training theory when and, and ignoring everything else that wraps around it. And I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a huge point. This, and, and hopefully this starts a discussion at least about more than just reps and sets and exercise selection. Because up to this point, I mean, that really is where most conversations seem to go. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for both of us. Thank you so much for coming on and having the conversation. Like we said, I'm going to strong arm you into coming back on. Although from your background, it sounds like you could easily beat us both up. So. <laughs> well, look, I, I don't know about that, but um, it'll listen, thank you. And what I would say is, obviously we talked about lots of big overlapping topics. Um, so I, I hope my input was, was kind of clear enough and again, I, I kind of seem to be framed as the anti periodization guy. I'm not. I understand why it was there. Um, but I do think it's time to evolve and evolve in a way that isn't just uh, slight tweaking. It's like saying, OK, no, no, no. We need to take a much more encompassing view. Um, and we need to, uh, yeah, to take a more... Uh, you could call it evidence-led approach, but it's also, I think, what the great coaches have been doing since the start of coaching. Mm -hmm. And that is inspiring people, convincing people, building trust, building relationships, showing the person you're working with that they have somebody here that they can invest in and trust and has their best interests at heart. Leave it there. Awesome. Thank you. That's a good way to wrap it up. That's perfect.